Hello, innovators. I am Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today, we're talking with Ali Adal, the self-proclaimed productivity guru, former junior doctor, podcaster, and YouTuber. So thank you for joining me on the Polymath Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I'm not sure I'm a self-proclaimed productivity guru. <laughs> there was one video where you said that. That's where I took oh, it from. I feel like yeah. I must have been trying to be sarcastic about it. Yeah, because... <laughs> probably. I think you were because you had a humorous tone in there, but I thought I'd kind of throw it in there because I nice, would actually <laughs> proclaim you as a productivity guru. Like I mentioned before the call, I think I found you through that kind of uh, productivity YouTuber section there. Yeah. It's like one of those weird things where I, ne I never thought I'd end up becoming a productivity guru. I didn't even realize productivity <laughs> gurus were a thing. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, if you said productivity guru to me, I would, say, I would just say Tim Ferriss and I wouldn't know who else is in that list. Yeah. But then but I just like my channel just started to evolve and everyone started asking, hey, how are you so productive? And I was like, wait a minute. I guess <laughs> I am productive. Maybe yeah. I can make videos about this. Well, and I love how you make a lot of stuff on like Notion too. And considering the fact that you just had the second brain on your channel too, with Tiago, it's just a lot of cool stuff going on there. Yeah, it's all, it's all good fun. Hello and welcome to the Polymath Polycast interviews and discussions. Please say hello to the innovators in the audience. That's the next part I was going to say. <laughs> hello innovators. Is this like yeah. your premium subscription thing? Actually, no, it's just my main interview, so to speak. I have three series, so micro, medium size, and then interviews. Oh, fun times. Yeah. Well, hello innovators. <laughs> so the way I like to break the ice is to have you share something about yourself that no one knows about you. Oh, damn. Something about me that no one knows about me. I answered this once in a Q&A, and I feel like not enough people saw that because no one watches Q&As. Uh, but I actually have a stutter, and this is something that I've, been, I've had since like the age of five, and it's really annoying. Um, it's not very bad at the moment, um, but there are times, especially when I don't get a lot of sleep, where I find myself stuttering on a lot of words. And it's something that I tried to get like hypnotherapy for and saw like a speech and language therapist for. And there doesn't seem to be a cure for it, which is why when I watched uh, films like The King's Speech, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is like really resonating with me. Yeah. Um, but the beauty of editing is that if you stutter, you just edit it out and no yeah. one thinks you have a speech impediment. So it's all good. Right. Well, and I remember in the beginning of my particular interviews, because this is my 42nd one, actually. But at the beginning, I would say, um, and ah, a lot, or even my guests would too. And so I spent a lot of time editing those out in a way. Yeah, I noticed as well. Like, I, become, I began to uh, just notice what the um waveform looked like on the editing software. So I, do, I would That's just awesome. know when I'm saying um or ah, uh, I can just like immediately cut it out. I, I didn't say it before our call, but I have a little note for, for each of my guests that I mentioned, but I don't always say it because I feel like it's kind of rude. Like if you could say, if you could not say um and or ah during the call, it would save me a lot of time editing, but I end up not saying it because I feel like that's a little bit of a rude thing to say or something like that. But. Yeah, probably. I guess for people who have not been on a lot of podcasts, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that I often, often uh, I'm, I'm sure to keep in mind is that in, in a normal conversation, there's lots of mm and uh, oh yeah and uh huh and I know that that's really annoying when, you're, when you've got a podcast. So I try and stay silent and I try and do like the, the encouragement with my just like nodding my head completely silently. Getting that body language in a way. No, that's crazy though. I actually took a clear communication class where they made us not do that the whole time. But in your video, My Last Day as a Doctor, that's something that came up recently. And I wanted to mention it. You talked about how you wanted to live your life. And one thing I took away of that is the concept of designing your life being an architect of what you are doing, whether it is for your enjoyment or for income, it doesn't matter, just as long as you control that aspect. And I actually created Poly Innovator for that same line of mindset, I guess you could say. So what was your mindset when you were designing your own life for the next couple of years? Hmm. I feel like I haven't done a very good job of designing my life for the next couple of years. Um, I feel at the moment, I am very much going like sort of one day to the next to the next. Mm -hmm. And if I have a plan for, for example, next week, then I consider that, oh, this is good forward planning. We've got a plan for next week. I feel like that's a function of the fact that, so I've, <clears throat> I've been unemployed now for about three weeks, having worked for two years as a doctor. And there's so much stuff that I've just kind of kept on putting off up until the point where I was going to be unemployed because I suddenly thought I would have gallons of free time and be able to sort everything out. But it seems like every day, like I'm not giving myself much time for deep work. And instead, there's just all these little things that need to get sorted out here and there and here and there. So I'm hoping that at some point over the next couple of weeks, as things become a little bit more manageable, then I'll be able to design some kind of life um, that I like, or design some kind of routine that I can follow. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking it would be really cool to be one of those productivity gurus who, you know, wakes up, does some meditation, does some journaling, goes to the gym, you know, then do some more writing and then <laughs> do some yeah. more deep work. You know, that, that sort of routine, I would love to be this, the sort of person who has that going on. So 
you know, I totally resonate with that. that. Yeah. It's interesting because that's exactly what I'm going through too right now where I, I don't, I didn't have a doctor <laughs> before me, but like I had a lot of stuff going on where these little details keep cropping up. For example, my Calendly, I need to set up different calendars, not just a polycast one. And I haven't got around to that. I haven't got around to sending the email I needed to send or something like that. It's just those little details that pile up. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been nice having an assistant for the last few months so she can deal with most of the little details, but I, th- I think one of the issues that I have is that I'm still not used to the fact that I can delegate stuff to people. And so I, for some reason, I, I guess when you've been a kind of technician uh, for so long, you get into that mindset where you, just by default, you assume that you have to do everything. Mm-hmm. And it's only sort of after you think about it, that you're like, wait a minute, no, I could actually delegate that to my team. And I think from what I've been reading about how to be a good manager or a good CEO, it's about kind of retraining your mind to think more about okay, I need to set the direction and then I should not be the one actually doing the work. Yeah. Um, and so I've got my assistant who's set up our Calendly and, you know, we've had a few kind of teething issues with it where events have been cancelled and no one quite knows what's going on. But I think over time, we'll develop a, a, good, <laughs> a good workflow for that yeah. sort of stuff. I was just about to mention, it's probably like a workflow thing where you just have to be able to set thing, something up where just set how a system that you want to be done and then try to modify it for your assistant's abilities. Oh, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. Thinking about kind of what would the perfect system look like and then they can f- kind of figure out how to, how to make it happen. Yeah. Right, to the questions here, let's start off by saying you're quite knowledgeable in the medical field as a junior doctor and a tech tuber and productivity expert, in my opinion, as I say, uh, gamer, as well as many other things. And so how would you define yourself? And this kind of leads into the whole polymathy aspect of the show, too. Ooh, <laughs> that's a I good know. question. Uh, so I'd be tempted to define myself by saying that I'm a doctor and a YouTuber and a podcaster. That's kind of the, the trio that I go for. Uh, I don't really like the word entrepreneur because I don't know. <laughs> it just has some negative connotations in my head. Mm-hmm. But recently I've started to try and not define myself based on what I do mm-hmm. and more based on who I am. And I'm having a real struggle with that because, you know, how do we define ourselves other than by the things that we do? I suppose sometimes people say, you know, who am I? Well, I'm a, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a, a believer in Jesus Christ. Which is a different way of saying of, of doing it, rather than I'm a doctor, a YouTuber, and I'm an entrepreneur. But I've, I feel like I don't really have a way of defining myself outside of what I do. Uh, it's something I'm working on. Yeah, well, and one thing I was kind of surprised to find out when I was researching you is that you are a gamer and you haven't spent much time talking about it on your channels and stuff like that. But I, I do see that you're excited about it. I think you had a PlayStation Four, right? Something like that. And it's just one of those things where I figured that like, that's one aspect about you, your personality and who you are that just isn't shared as much. So maybe there's a little bit of portrayal in a way or how you want to brand yourself in a way, I guess you could say. Yeah, potentially. Although I only bought a PS4 like two months ago at the <sighs> sort of halfway through lockdown because all my friends were playing, were playing Warzone and I felt mm-hmm. like I was missing out on social interaction uh, because of all the chats that happen on the, on the PlayStation 4 group chat. So I kind of downloaded Warzone. I played a few games and I wasn't super into it. Mm-hmm. And because the the only the only PlayStation Four bundle that had Amazon Prime was the one that included The Last of Us and Uncharted Four and Horizon, and so I thought, well, you know what, I might as well get these games because I've heard really good things about all of them. And then I started kind of playing Horizon a little bit, but I always found that at the end of like a gaming sesh, I would always feel a little bit drained. Whereas if I'm if I actually want to relax, then I actually enjoy reading more so than gaming. But you know, when I was younger, I used to play a lot of World of Warcraft. I clocked in about 180 days of playtime on it over the course of about three years. That's, that's a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that was some of the happiest times of my life when I was just playing, playing, playing WoW. Yeah. And so I've kind of got this plan in my head that, you know, it would be really nice to get a gaming PC. And when November 2020 comes around, when the new expansion pack for World of Warcraft released, then I can get back into it. And this time I'll be able to, you know, game for hours on end and my mom won't be able to call me down for dinner because i live on my own check me out (laughs) that's funny so that's kind of what i'm leaning towards on the gaming front but i certainly wouldn't call myself a gamer uh, at this point at this point but at heart maybe and i think it's interesting too that you mentioned the reading part i think that when you're younger you're probably able to get into flow a lot better with gaming but now that you've been more you're trying to lean towards that productivity light mindset like you don't feel you feel like you don't want to do something unless it could bring you something unless you can gain something from it that's very true. That's another big part of why. But then I, I don't produce a lot out of, out of reading either. I think, I, I wonder if it's just that societal expectation we have that reading is considered a good thing and gaming is considered a bad thing. Even though like realistically, it's, it's like, you know, <laughs> if anything, gaming basically. makes you like develops more abilities in, in yeah. you than reading does. 
I don't know. That's another aspect that I need to, I need to really come to terms with. Like, to what extent do I actually enjoy gaming? Mm-hmm. And to what extent do I allow the fact that I feel like I have to be productive at all times to interfere with that? Yeah, I resonate with that. Because I, I, if I play games for more than 30 minutes, I feel like I'm letting myself down on some other thing I could be working on. So, no, yeah. what's interesting yeah. is that, like, uh, yeah, <laughs> gaming can be pretty productive, too. Like, Tetris for training the brain, training the spatial awareness. But getting back to the questions, actually, the next question is actually about books. So how many books do you end up reading a week or month? I was looking at my, my list the other day. I've, st- I've started keeping a list of all the books that I'm reading. So let's mm-hmm. see. Three so far in August. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight in july uh like five in june that's pretty good in May. so on average sort of one to two a week i would say depending on what's going on yeah that seems like it's a pretty solid amount too considering that do you read more nonfiction or fiction based uh it kind of varies i like to always have a fiction book going on audible and a non-fiction book going on audible and a fiction book on kindle and a non-fiction book on kindle <laughs> and so i would just kind of go with whatever i feel like in the moment so yeah. this last few weeks, I've been finishing off the Wheel of Time uh, series on Audible. It's an incredible fantasy series with 14 books. Wow. And I've been listening to that since May 2019. And I finished it like yesterday. And I was like, cried my eyes out at the ending because oh. I was like, oh, I've been with these characters for so long and now it's over. And, yeah. and because that was getting so good for the, like, the final four books, I was just tearing through that and ignoring all nonfiction. I'm also trying to do this thing where once I finish a nonfiction book, I will kind of write up my notes and highlights from it. But I've got this long list of books that I've just, just keeps racking up where I have to actually get around to summarizing my highlights on it. And I've kind of told myself that, Ali, you're not allowed to read any more nonfiction until you actually take notes and get something useful out of the ones you've already read, which is why I just keep on just racking up the fiction. And I started a new series today called Six of Crows on Audible, which is another like fantasy type series. So it, it's, le- it's, it's leaning heavily towards fiction these days. That's interesting. And if you are already summarizing what you've already put down, it's your words, but what if you were to de- delegate that summarization and just put the notes down, it's your, like your notes, it's your ideas that's coming from that, but the summarization is coming from someone. Else. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. Um, we sometimes do that. So I've got, I've got a series on YouTube called Book Club, uh, mm-hmm. which is about kind of distilling summaries and, and highlights from popular books. And one of my team members kind of tends to write most of those videos usually I'll read a book first and send him my highlights and he'll read it as well and kind of turn it into a script. But I think when it comes to my own book notes, I'm more mostly doing it for myself rather than for other people. And so the act of summarizing a book and turning it into evergreen notes as per the kind of Zettelkasten method of note-taking and how to take smart notes, all of that stuff, just, I, I feel like the, the fact that I'm doing that is, is actually better for me. And it's more a thing that I'm doing for myself rather than to churn out content out of that, even though everything else I do is purely for the purposes of churning out content. Yeah. Well, and you do have that idea of like your autodidact where you want to learn and you like to get that more concrete idea of like, I want to get this stuck into here. If I, if I learn it, I don't want to forget it. And so yeah. like summarizing okay. it helps with that space repetition. Yeah, absolutely. And also the, the, there's been a few books that I've, because I, th- I think historically I've been very much into the uh, business self-help personal development you know just that ge- that generic genre of books and there's very few actual insights to be had in those after you've read some of the books because they're all essentially remixes of the same concept right. but recently i started to branch out a little bit and i read the elephant in the brain mm-hmm. uh, and the righteous mind which is all about kind of morality and the different moral taste receptors that we have and kind of conservatives versus liberals and kind of the ways people think about morality and topics like that are stuff that i've never really read anything about before and I know they're really interesting to talk about. And so I really want to uh, kind of dive into my highlights for those books so I can, in my own head, I'll, I'd, I'd be able to kind of explain to a five-year-old, uh, you know, what <laughs> Jonathan Haidt argues about why liberals vote a certain way and when why conservatives vote a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of thing where I've got disparate things in my head and I, I, I haven't grappled with the topic enough to be able to kind of string them all together in my head. Um, so that's something I'd like to do. Out of curiosity too, what tool do you like to use to take your notes? Is it like Notion or Roam or? Yeah, so I use Roam to take notes. Um, I, I tend to use Roam as like my personal note-taking app. And I tend to use Notion as like note-taking for my team. So like if we're going to create a video out, out of something, it'll be in Notion. But if I'm taking personal notes, it'll be in Roam. And then I'll copy and paste into Notion if it then needs to become a team collaboration type stuff. I can't wait for the API. So that could be automatic. <laughs> yeah, that could be cool. <laughs> Save a few keystrokes there. Yeah. And so one of your most recent videos, actually, you talked about that book, The Elephant in the Brain. What were your elephant in the brain for, or motives for coming on the show today? 
I added that in after <laughs> I saw that. That's a good point. So for context, the elephant in the brain is the idea that, um, you know, uh, it's, it's about the hidden motives in, in life. Uh, so for example, if you were to ask me, why do you make YouTube videos? The official reason would be, oh, well, because it's fun and it helps people in it. You know, it's nice to be able to inspire others and to have a creative outlet. But the real reason would be because, it, you know, I like the fame, the status, yeah. the money and the prestige that it affords me. But that would be like, you know, it's, it's less socially acceptable to talk about. If you ask someone why you're a doctor, it's kind of, it's not very socially acceptable to say because I love the feeling of power and I love the prestige. <laughs> you kind of more have to say, well, I love the fact that you're always learning and you get to help people. So it's kind of the, the, the elephant, kind of like the elephant in the room is that thing that everyone knows is there, but no one is talking about. The elephant in the brain is similar. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you're asking my reasons for coming on the show, honestly, ever since I've, uh, I kind of uh, outsourced email to my assistant, she, she now just books me in for random podcast recordings. And I often don't know anything about the podcasts <laughs> prior to going on them, except yours, because we have rescheduled like three times now. And so I was like, okay, I need to actually look at this <laughs> and look at this list of questions so I don't come completely unprepared. Well, and I sent you like 31 questions. There are actually 32 with that new one there too. And it's just like, that's a lot to go over. Hopefully we can make it through most of those, but it is interesting. Yeah. That's, that's nice how she's helping you out with that. Have you heard of matchmaker.fm? No. What is that? It's a podcast host and guest matching platform, kind of like Tinder on the way. So I'll definitely send you a link afterwards. It'd be really useful. Oh, interesting. That's very interesting. But that's interesting how you were mentioning the um, reasoning for coming on the show too. And it, I think that it's a good teaser what you just said there for the video you just released today. So oh, someone, yeah. oh yeah, the video came out today. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> by the time this recording's out, it won't be today, but I will put the link in my description here for you. Thank you. And then, so kind of pivoting to more of a focus kind of based topic, what are some areas that have engaged you enough in the state of flow? Hmm. I find that I often get into flow if I'm trying to explain what might be a complicated topic in simple English. So mm. for example, one video I'm working on is an introduction to investing and like what investing in the stock market means and stuff like that. And I found that I really got into a flow state when, when, when thinking about, okay, how, how do you actually explain this? What's like a good first principles understanding of why and how people should invest their money. And I think when it's stuff like that, where I have to take a topic that I know about, but trying to kind of break it down for, for the audience, that is very easy to get into a flow for. Um, I found it quite hard to get into a flow for other things these days. Um, partly because my schedule has just been, kind of littered with all these random random hangouts with people and stuff which is a good thing because i want to you know partly the reason for being unemployed is to have the flexibility to have random lunches with friends and like go to the gym with a friend when, when they ask but it often means that i only get like sort of one or two hours of uninterrupted time and i find that that possibly i'm making excuses for myself but i feel like it's not a lot of time to get into flow properly um but that's why i think now we've decided that we're going to do all of our kind of interviews and coffee hangouts with fans and stuff on a Tuesday and then leave the rest of the week as blank as possible. And that's going some way towards helping me find, find time to do some deep work. I find that it's kind of like an all or nothing mentality though. Like right now you have a whole bunch going on. So it's like all of your schedule doing meetings, but then doing it on Tuesday is almost like just a barely small subset of the day of the week. I don't know. I think that's really good though, to have that time set out for it. Cause I was wondering too about your deep work hours and this, but they also said you, two hours, you said, is not enough to get into flow. But I also wonder if that time constraint would be a good motivator to get into flow. Yeah, quite possibly. So certainly when I was working full time, I would get into flow in the evenings because I would have, I would have no other choice. Uh -huh. But I think now, kind of Parkinson's law in action, when you, when you have the whole day to film, film a video, you end up filming it at 10 p.m. rather than <laughs> 10 a.m. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that actually makes a lot of sense. And do you have any advice for people like you and I who are filling up our days kind of willy nilly like that? And we're trying to, or let's say we're trying to get a task done. Like today I had to edit a video and it took me most of the morning to get done when in reality it should have only taken me a couple hours. Yeah, How can we I maximize wish, that? <laughs> I wish I had some good techniques for this. Uh, the one that I, that's worked for me more recently is, for, for example, I will actively schedule a gym session at like 11 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. which means I have to wake up at eight and then I, I have to get the video done before 11. Otherwise the rest of the day is completely gone. Um, and kind of setting, so setting artificial deadlines as well. Like, I mean, apart from one sponsored video a week, which comes out on Tuesday, we actually don't have any uh, proper deadlines for videos on the channel, mm -hmm. but I try and say, okay, we're going to do a video on Tuesdays, a video on Fridays and a video on, a video on Sundays. And this very arbitrary release schedule holds me to some sort of deadline. Mm -hmm. I find that most of the time I manage to stick to that and, talking my brain into actually doing some work. Yeah. You introduced me to the concept of the third door, how any successful person in life most likely got there through the third door. Can you go over that idea for the audience? 
Oh, yeah. This was an amazing book that I read, I think, last year by Alex Banian, uh, or Banian, however you pronounce it. And um, he was like a, a 21-year-old college student, not really knowing what, what he was going to do with his life. Mm-hmm. And so he decided he was going to go on a mission uh, to interview the world's most successful people uh, to find out uh, what they were doing at the age of 21 uh, and how they got how they got where they are. Mm-hmm. And over the course of his journey, which spanned like five plus years and turned into this really interesting narrative book that had lots of moving and emotional moments in it. Over the course of his journey, as he interviewed all these people, um, he found out, he, he came to this analogy that life is like a nightclub in that there are always, in that there are three doors uh, in sort of in work or in business or, or, or in life. Mm-hmm. The first door is the door that everyone kind of queues up, uh, queues outside of. It's like, you know, the queue lasts three blocks. Everyone is kind of standing in line trying to get in, trying to get in through the main entrance. The second door is the door for the billionaires and the celebrities. They can just walk in. Uh, but what no one tells you is that there's always a third door. And the third door is when you go down the side street, you notice that the kitchen window is a little bit open. So you open the window, you sneak in through the kitchen, you make friends with the, the chef in the kitchen, and you kind of yeah. sneak your way into the nightclub through the third door. And whether it's Bill Gates landing his first software deal or Steven Spielberg becoming the youngest Hollywood director, mm-hmm. um, they all took the third door. And I think that's just like a sick way of thinking about it. Yeah, life. that's fascinating. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's like an opportunistic mindset in a way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have an example, actually, I think it might be really interesting to talk about because one day at that point, I wanted to get a new skill, which was salsa. I saw a salsa club in town. Let's go over there. Let's try a new bar. Never been there before. Don't know anybody there. So my kind of personal rule was is to meet everybody, whether it's staff or people who are regulars and just try to get everyone's name, get to know them introduce myself and because of that i had talked to the front desk person i talked to the dj the bartender the security person everyone knew me after the first day and so mm-hmm. the next time i came there i didn't want to wear the bracelet because i wasn't going to drink that night and that was just like the alcoholic bracelet i was like oh, i don't need it i'm not gonna drink it's like oh yeah i've seen you before you're regular that's no problem after just one day and it's just one of those things where had i not taken the time to do that introduction it probably wouldn't have happened yeah, and that is very third doorsy of you. I kind of wish I I did that more often. Like, I think it takes it takes a lot of guts to actively go out of your way and, uh, and kind of introduce yourself to people and, and ask for their names and stuff. And yeah, it's 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 something I wish I did more of. Would you consider yourself more of an introvert or extrovert, perhaps? That Probably be- more of an introvert overall. I can certainly pretend to be extroverted at times, and I love hanging out with people and playing board games. Uh, but I have found more and more recently that. Actually, I do enjoy time on my own and just kind of sitting with myself on my iPad or reading a book yeah. or just even going to the cinema on my own. I quite, quite enjoy doing that. <laughs> so I feel like that probably makes me more of an introvert. Hmm, yeah. But I mean, I think that's still kind of interesting. Someone in my family told me about how she used to go to the cinema all by herself all the time. This is stuff that she likes to do. I've never gone to the movies on my own. Never Never Have you ever tried it? I've, I've wanted to. That's the thing. Yeah. I've wanted to, but I never got around to doing it. I will now that I've talked to you about it. I think that's interesting. Nice. It's, it's really good. Would recommend. It's, yeah. it's better than going with friends, in my opinion. <laughs> well, and then you get to experience it all yourself too. But I noticed you've been on IGTV for a long time now, or a while now at least. And I actually thought it was pretty early on the platform, but you started 110 weeks ago, at least at the time I wrote that question, probably 100, 112 weeks ago at this point. But what made you decide to jump on board when it released? I think with IGTV, when it released, everyone was thinking, oh, could this be the next big thing? And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to take a page out of Gary Vee's book and I'm going to jump on this as soon as I can. I think I released like one or two videos on it in the first few weeks. And then I realized that no one cares and IGTV wasn't really going to be a thing. Mm. Um, And it's only recently that once uh, I've, you know, me and my team, we now take, for example, podcast clips that I've been on and we repurpose them into clips for Twitter and Instagram. And now the IGTV sort of, pages swelling a bit more with content but certainly at the, at the start i thought okay this might be big let me make a bet on it and then realize actually no maybe not yeah well i think that just having that presence there does make it more unique because if someone is checking out your profile and sees oh he has a channel let's check it out they might stay on your profile longer too which is nice yeah potentially i don't i don't, I don't think very hard about my instagram account i feel like i should probably think about it more but mm-hmm. f- for me it's more like as long as the youtube channel is growing i just know that people will funnel over auto automatically almost by default to instagram and twitter so i focus all my growth efforts on the youtube channel and i kind of forget about the other two yeah. i just think it's interesting too because it's a matter of macro focus and micro focus is something i've been talking about lately and your micro focus is making sure you get content out and just trying to repurpose it as much as possible your macro is like okay let's make sure youtube is the main kind of channel that people can focus on and find me on yeah absolutely yeah 
how much does content repurposing then, like you said, your podcast clips and stuff like that come into play? Or do you, do you like to make vertical videos at all? Uh, no, I never make vertical videos. <laughs> <laughs> it's all purely repurposed stuff. Yep. Yeah, and I found that, for, for example, uh, if I'm being inter interviewed on a podcast like this, you know, we've mm -hmm. got the recording, we've got the video recording. Uh, this could make for some interesting kind of sort of clippable segments. And so I'll send that to my team and they'll chop it up into bits. And yeah, uh, yeah. it's like a surprisingly easy way of creating content. Um, I like the fact that most of what I do has like a dual purpose in some capacity or another. For sure. So being a guest on a podcast becomes content for Instagram and Twitter on top of actually being a guest on that podcast. Yeah, I use a tool called repurpose.io to make clips of these. Going off to another kind of pivot in a way, what has it been like to run Six Med? It was really fun for the first three years and then it got really boring, mm. <laughs> if I'm being honest. So this was um, a company that I set up in my second year of med school. It was a company to help uh, kids basically get into medical school. It's a fairly cliche idea. Almost anyone with a shred of entrepreneurial spirit, uh, once they get into med school, they realize, hang on, this is a pretty good market. I think I can tutor kids here. I think the reason uh, Six Med was successful is because I knew how to make a website look pretty. And at mm -hmm. the time, it was hard to make websites look pretty. This was like 2013. Oh, yeah. Nowadays, it's super easy with Squarespace and, and all that stuff. Probably not sponsored. Um, <clears throat> but it was really fun for the first three years. And I think it was fun because the numbers kept on going up. Mm -hmm. And every year we were like growing and, and like growing is really cool. And even if the job itself is a bit tedious, like arranging the logistics of physical courses and arranging the printing of books, Mm -hmm. while it's all growing and while it's all fun games, it feels good. It feels like what you're doing has some kind of purpose. But around about like 2016, that was when our numbers started to dip a little bit. Awesome. And I noticed that it just became so much less fun. And I feel like a big part of the fact, a big part of that was because the numbers were dipping. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I found myself, you know, we started uh, delegating and expanding the team. And now I wasn't doing much of the physical teaching anymore because it was a high leverage use of my time to just focus on the website, for example. And so the stuff that I enjoyed about it, i.e., you know, teaching kids how to do well in, in medical school entrance exams, I ended up not really doing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it became like not very enjoyable at all. Um, I don't know. It's, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those things where I think if I, if I were to do another company, I would, I would definitely delegate a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. Well, and it seems like I mentioned earlier, you're more autodidactic. You like to learn, but it also seems like you like to teach as well. You have that kind of uh, didactic feeling almost like your content and just you said there your favorite part was tutoring those people did that lead you to becoming an alumni for that second brain with tiago then yeah partly i've always been interested in in teaching i think my first teaching gig was when i was 13 i had like mm -hmm. a job teaching maths and english at like a local tutoring center and that was just like really fun um and i think the fact that i i've enjoyed teaching and i have a preacher gene inside of me <laughs> that came out kind of through the youtube channel and it just means that I just love the performance art aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and so when the opportunity came around to be a, an alumni mentor for Building a Second Brain, uh, which is Tiago Forte's course, I kind of thought, yeah, it would be kind of fun to do the teaching. Although I feel like it's less of a teaching role because my own digital note-taking system isn't fully developed. The reason I went for it is more because I thought it would be a really good way for me myself to actually learn more of the concepts in the course. Mm -hmm. And I thought that you know, if I force myself if, if I've got the accountability of having to lead a live session once a week for two hours, then that'll force me to do the work. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if it was just like a self-motivated thing, I'd be a lot less likely to actually engage with it properly. Right. And that, it goes back to that accountability thing. And I resonate with your whole preacher gene, so to speak, because I'm a swim instructor and someone actually referred to me as a stock reel of information. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. The preacher gene. <laughs> The preacher gene and accountability. This is like a title in the making right there. Now, um, you've had your podcast, Not Overthinking, for about a year and a half now. What inspired its creation? So kind of preacher gene? Mm. So my brother and I were both thinking, you know, at, at some point we should probably do a podcast because I think, you know, for me, once you have a YouTube channel and an Instagram and a Twitter, mm -hmm. podcast is kind of the next step. You feel like, well, you know, there's a whole segment of the audience here that I'm missing by not having a podcast. My brother was also always interested in having his own podcast to talk about like, you know, to really overthink about like, you know, what makes friendship interesting and what makes an awkward silence and those kind of topics. And one day we were just like, you know what, why don't we just do this podcast ourselves? Because one issue we were running into when doing it solo was that, well, how do you actually find guests every week? <laughs> it seems like a really hard job, <laughs> especially when Matchmaker. they reschedule on you like four times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that seems like no, an absolute ball egg. <laughs> uh, that matchmaker.fm is a great way. That's how I got started. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that wasn't around, or at least we didn't yeah. know about it. And so we just thought, you know what, let's do a conversational podcast once a week where we just talk to one another. Mm -hmm. And at the very least, it'll be nice to have a chat to each other. And, 
you know, best case scenario, other people get involved and enjoy the conversation. So it kind of started like that. It's been a bit of a struggle doing it absolutely every week, but I think most weeks we've, we've got an episode out. Yeah. I think it's interesting too, because you, you wanted to get it there. You wanted to get it done. And so you're like, okay, let's just start, get started. And a lot of people don't have that grit to get past the first little hurdle. I mean, as a YouTuber, obviously you had the experience of creating content, but there's always that idea of like, Oh, I don't like hearing my own voice or do I know if I'm sounding right? Or am I able to with interviews, at least have that act of listening, read that person's body language if they're getting bored, seeing them nod, that kind of thing. I think yeah. I think definitely at the start, it was a real, it was more of a struggle for, for my brother because he, he hadn't done the content stuff before. Mm. And so he had a very high bar for what a good episode would be. Whereas my whole thing was look, it, it, like, we'd get to the end of an episode and we'd think, oh God, that was a terrible episode. And I would say, no, we have to release it anyway because we'll get better with time. And th- this is not going to be sustainable if we, have, <laughs> if we have any kind of quality bar. Yeah. And we kind of realized as well that we are terrible judges of the quality of our own stuff because mm-hmm. even for episodes where we thought this was a total waste of time, we would still get emails from people saying, oh my God, I love this episode. It changed my life. And so we just sort of started to care less about whether an episode was good before releasing it. And I think that really helped keep up the regular once yeah. a week cadence. For sure. And actually before the polycast, I had a different podcast for my older brand that was similar in nature, but I didn't necessarily see it as like the same kind of thing. So when I started with my new podcast host, I had just started from scratch. I had two episodes. That was it. Yet I had around 30 that I had already made before on different platforms. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to start fresh and do it here. But then I thought, well, if someone like you, I want to ask you to come on my show and you see my list, there's only a couple episodes on there. Well, Obviously, he's not that experienced, even though I had years of experience beforehand. So I decided, you know what? Even if it's not the greatest quality, even if it's not super related to what I'm doing just yet, I'll put it on there anyway. Since I put the other series on there and that filled up basically a full season's worth of content that people actually went back on when they invited him on the show. And they're like, wow, I really resonated with that old episode. Even though I thought like, oh, man, that was like crappy <laughs> compared to what I make now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I really like um, Derek Sever's idea of, you know, what's what's obvious to you might be amazing to others. Mm-hmm. And I often think of that when I have too much of a bar for myself where I think, oh, come on, you know, I'm not seeing anything new in this video or yeah, every, everyone knows about these productivity tips, mm-hmm. but they don't. And so, yeah. Well, and you kind of think of every kind of piece of content, almost like the rabbit hole starts. Some people might find you that way. And so if you can tease those other little things about it, people can find you down that hole. Yeah, that's very true. It's just, it's like every, every piece of content is just another entry point into the rest of your stuff. But speaking of Derek Scissors, I really like his now page concept. What do you think about that? Yeah, I love it. I think it's a great idea. I've been in, intending to do it for my own website, but again, I haven't, haven't yet got around to it. Maybe <laughs> now that you have time. I've got time now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's on the to-do list. So this metric might be a little bit different now that we got to the recording, but over the past three months or so, you've gained over 270,000 subscribers on YouTube. How does that feel? can speak today. today. Um, the numbers stop, mean any, stop meaning anything after a while. Mm. <laughs> I often compare it like every milestone I, I think feels identical to the 5,000 subscriber milestone. That was when kind of, I noticed a linear increase in my own, like, Ooh, this is cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then once I hit that point beyond that, I haven't felt anything extra for having a hundred thousand, 500,000 close to a million subscribers now. So maybe the million subscriber thing will change, but yeah. honestly, I doubt it. I think 5,000 is a good number. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that actually makes me think I was on a music artist channel who had like, I don't know, 20 million subscribers. And the thing is, I think like I was, what you just said there, how does it feel to be on that side and how like they start thinking instead of just one subscriber, like a thousand subscribers, that's awesome. Each one of those people are people I can meet if I got around to doing that. But now that you get to like a hundred thousand, that's all you start thinking almost into thousands instead of the single digit. And then you start getting to the million, you start getting to the thousands. And I almost think about what is the thought processes behind that too. Yeah. And so this is partly why I, I have kind of a standing offer on my website that if anyone wants to grab a coffee with me and visits Cambridge, then I'll buy them a coffee. Mm-hmm. And so earlier today, um, from like 2 p.m. till 6 p.m., I was stationed in a coffee shop in town. And I think like eight different people came and had coffee at various times. Some of them stayed for the whole thing and some of them kind of stayed for a little bit and then went and kind of some of them became friends with one another. And it was just kind cool. of a generally nice vibe. And we were talking about this and, you know, like this is eight random eight random people out of the 975,000. Uh, yeah. But I've actually got to meet them and it kind of makes it seem more legit and more real. Whereas otherwise it's literally just numbers on a screen. Mm-hmm. I wonder if there's a way to make all those people. I mean, granted, it's you don't have enough time to meet with like a million people, but I wonder if there's a way to try to make it more connected and more of an important feeling. 
Yeah, I wonder. This is something I've, I think about a fair bit. There's a guy who we interviewed on our podcast a few weeks ago called Paul Millard, who mm. um, you know, writes a lot about the future of work and workism and how we all care about corporate ladders too much. Um, but he has a, a thing called, uh, that he calls a Curiosity Conversations, mm -hmm. uh, where he just has a Calendly where basically any time on any time every Wednesday, you can just book in a half an hour chat with him and talk about anything at all. And he says that he just connects with really cool people that way, the people that watch his stuff and that res it resonates with them enough to warrant wanting to have a half an hour long chat with him. So I think possibly something like that. But I think doing stuff in person, there is some secret sauce to it that you don't really get over a Zoom call. So yeah, I don't know. Well, and what I find is with these interviews, it's kind of that same networking mentality where I wanted to become friends with you and have a conversation with you. It's like, oh, let's invite him on the show. He's polymathic. It's a perfect, <laughs> perfect combination there. And it's just like, when I edit this, I'll watch you versus watching the camera. And so I'll get to see your reactions for the second time and hear your thoughts. And it almost seems like I have a conversation with you twice in a way. So it's kind of nice though. Oh yeah. I guess it's nice if you're, if you're doing your own editing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but actually, even if I had someone editing, I do like to do the timestamps on my own. So when I have someone editing my video, I'll go back and make the timestamps, find the quotes that I like, and then watch it over again. Why do you like doing that? Well, for one, the timestamps are good on YouTube because they show up on that play bar, which I yep. think is useful. And then on top of that, I think that I wanted to have my own touch on it. And I also like to choose which micro content comes out. And so I usually choose the like, micro content when I'm doing that along with quotes. And I also get to, like you said earlier, to like uh, concrete the information more because I, I want to get that summarization, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Besides the 100 videos minimum kind of basic idea, or at least one weekly video and those such things, what are some advanced tips that are going through video platforms like YouTube? Ooh, good question. I'm, I'm actually working on a course about this. So I've been thinking about this a lot because I think there's a lot of stuff out there on YouTube about how to get started, how to make a title, how to make a thumbnail, how to kind of tell a story. But I think a lot fewer people are talking about the meta game behind content creation, whereby I think the pitch is that you want to be able to systematically and effortlessly churn out content week, week after week. And in a way, incorporating the second brain stuff whereby you want a system that uh, takes your ideas and uh, stuff that you've read, watched, and listened to as inputs. You, you want a system that kind of refines and distills those ideas. And then you want, you want that system to output content in the form of whatever you're interested in. So in my case, it'll be video scripts. In other people's cases, it'll be blog posts and tweet storms and, and stuff like that. And so I think there's a lot that can be said on the workflow side about how to make this process as efficient as possible. And then there's interesting things about kind of when you start working with an editor and you start working with writers and researchers and delegating aspects of this system, uh, just to kind of working towards this goal of systematically and effortlessly creating content um, as, you know, as, as regularly as possible. And right. so in, in, in terms of some like advanced tips, I think Notion is really good for this because you can actually, you can literally put ideas into it and they can start off as an idea and then you can use the Kanban board feature to make it, you know, you can keep track of who's writing what scripts and what mm -hmm. at what stage the different video ideas are at. I also really like the idea, one of the ideas from the second brain is uh, the slow burn, which is that when you have ideas and you have these projects, as you read, watch, listen to stuff, as you have your own ideas, you just kind of expand to them over time. So in, the, in a way you've got like multiple pots on the slow burner and you're slowly adding to them over time, which means that at the end of it, when it comes down to um, putting the final video together, you're not starting from scratch. You're starting from this half cooked pot of stuff that's been on the slow burner for the last months, sometimes even years. Yeah. I think workflow, like that sort of workflow based on, you know, systematically and effortlessly doing the content. I think developing that sort of workflow is, is at least how I managed to churn out content somewhat regularly. Yeah. Well, I've been watching August Bradley's Notion videos about uh, pipes, pillars, and vaults and how he tries to churn out stuff. And it makes me think of like the resonance calendar where you can pull in things that you like from Pocket or Notion and then be able to write ideas about them, like you're saying, and then put them into the content cycle. I love the combine for feature, like you're mentioning. One thing I actually really liked was that I used Airtable before, but each line in the database requires having a separate tool, like Google Docs to have the document in. I, I think the Pro actually has a document feature, but at the time it wasn't as good. And when I found Notion, I found that every line in a database acts like its own document. And that just yeah. made a big difference. Also too, you could have a second database inside each document. So if you want to plan out your social calendar within that particular page, it's really nice. Yeah, absolutely. It's got a lot of interesting features that make it very good for this sort of systematic content creation. So 
the first video I saw on your channel was Duranka Pereira singing All of Me, I presume on your guitar, your own guitar. What motivated you to upload that first video? Oh man. So uh, when I, my dream was always to be a music YouTuber. Mm. Have, you, have you come across a guy called Kurt Hugo Schneider? I have not. Oh, so he is like my idol. He's amazing. Um, he's been on YouTube since like 2006 or something stupid like that. And well, he, he's, he, he plays a lot of instruments and he also is very good at arranging, uh, arranging tracks. And so what, and, and he's got loads of friends who are amazing at singing. He's pretty good at singing, but he's not like sort of stellar level, kind of like me. Like I, I, I can just about sing, but I'm not amazing. Um, and so what Kurt, Kurt does is that he plays all the instruments and kind of multi-track layers himself playing instruments. And then he gets his friend to sing the songs. And they've got like these incredible music videos where they're producing these amazing covers of popular songs. Mm -hmm. And so like from 2010 or something like that, I, I, I wanted to be the next Kurt Schneider because I knew that I, I enjoyed music. I enjoyed learning instruments. I enjoy the idea of arranging, but I'm not very good at singing myself. And I have lots of friends who are amazing at it. One of those friends being Duranka. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from like 2010 up to like 2017, very occasionally I would dabble with this. I would think, okay, I'm going to become a music YouTuber now. And then I'd kind of rope in one of my friends to sing a song. But I just never, never really took it seriously, never really did it properly. And so the first video on the channel was, I think it was the summer holiday of one of my years of med school where me and my friend Duranko from school, we were like, all right, we're going we're gonna to make a video today. And that was our job for the day. And it was quite fun. And I learned a lot. And that was how I first got started with video editing and Premiere Pro and, and stuff like that. But I think when I started to do YouTube properly in 2017, the music side wasn't really a part of it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I actually really resonate this with almost in the opposite way. I can't seem to figure out how to do the instruments or make the tracks, but I love singing and I have a list of covers I want to do and that kind of thing. So I think it's funny how we're on the opposite ends. Yeah. Where, whereabouts, whereabouts are you based? Uh, Missouri in the U.S. Missouri. Oh, okay. Yeah. At some point when I visit the U.S., we can do a jam session. For sure. Or if I ever visit over there. across the Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's probably easier for you to visit the UK than it is for me to come to the US. <laughs> There's a whole th tangent. We can the whole on. visa thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, the visa thing on top of that, too, like, there's been like weird border things, stuff like that, too. But um, no, but it's, it's super cool, though. And I actually approach Poly Innovator in phases. Like the first phase is about self-education and polymathy. And then down the line, I want to do like gaming and music. And so I think that it's kind of interesting how we both wanted to make YouTube not YouTube, but like this video is around our music enjoyment. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> That's cool. Pivoting a little bit. What's the reasoning behind the Medics making an app series? Oh, God. Uh, that was ages ago. That was 2017. <laughs> um, I do a lot of digging. <laughs> this was... Uh, so I've, I've always been interested in coding, kind of dabbling in coding. And mm -hmm. I remember w w we were on our medical elective. So elective is a thing that as medical students, you can go to basically anywhere and work in a hospital for a few weeks at a time just to get mm -hmm. some experience. And so I was with a friend of mine and we were like, hey, you know, we should make an app. And we had this idea for like this surgical training logbook because we noticed that when we were doing, when we were um, kind of observing operations and stuff in Cambodia in this plastic surgery center, we were tracking it in like a Google sheet and we were like, well, you know, this is kind of annoying. It would be nice if there was an app for this and it would be nice if that app connected to the Royal College of Surgeons e-logbook. And that means as a medical student, you can keep track of all the operations that you've watched and you've assisted in. And that would be useful for, let's say you're applying for a job five years done in the future, you can say, hey, look, I've observed a thousand operations, look at me. And we were thinking this would be kind of quite a cool app to make. And around the same time, I would, I'd just gotten started on YouTube. So I was thinking, oh, Gary V, document don't create. Um, let me make a series about talking about how we build this app. And so I think we released like five episodes of the series. And I thought it was pretty reasonable. Uh, but then we tried to get funding for the app. We applied for some university grant and then we didn't get it. And then university started again and we had final exams and we just couldn't be bothered to do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so I just pretend like that never happened. I think it's kind of cool though. It's part of your history, but that's why I wanted to mention it. So. Uh, yeah. so I believe as content creators or entrepreneurs, we have to be polymathic in order to actually be successful. So you have to be able to create content, market it, and do all these different things, such as omnichannel endeavors, for example. What is your opinion on that? What kind of that interdisciplinary mindset? Yeah, I agree. I think it's a, a definitely a good thing. Um, I think I first came across this in Peter Thiel's Zero to One, mm. where he talks about um, how innovation often happens in the intersection of multiple fields. And that really resonated with me when I, first, when I first read it, because what I was thinking is that it would be cool, because I'd been coding for a while, and I was also in, in medicine. And what I was thinking kind of based on that is that when it comes to things like medical technology, 
it would be more interesting to, for example, be a fully specialized consultant, like a, a super specialist and keep up my coding and tech background because only once you're a super specialist can you actually appreciate the problems that super specialists in a field would have. Whereas I had a lot of friends who were interested in medical technology just generally because everyone seems to be. But they were, they were thinking, hey, you know what? I'm not going to work as a doctor it's straight after med school and I'm going to join a med tech startup. And I always kind of felt that that seems a bit weird, right? Because if you join a med tech startup straight out of med school, you're, there's, there's nothing special about you. Yeah, you've been through med school, but you, you know, you've not practiced as an actual doctor. So you won't actually appreciate what the problems are mm -hmm. apart from the very low hanging fruit of let's make a middleman app that connects, uh, I don't know, medical staffing with doctors or you, you know, something low hanging. Whereas the real interesting innovations I think would happen at the, at the intersection of specialist uh, interests. And so that's, uh, that, that was what first turned me on to that idea. And, and certainly as I've been kind of creating content, the more I find is that the more interdisciplinary my approach is, you know, you, you read a book about startups and you find you can actually apply that to a YouTube video. You read a yeah. book about medicine and you find that actually there's a lot of concepts here that could make for a good podcast episode. And I find that the more I broaden my horizons and things that I can do, the more my content and just everything gets better. So I'm very bullish on the polymathic approach. Yeah, I love that. It kind of makes me think of the T-chart where someone who's a specialist, but also has the wide width of knowledge as well. Oh, yeah. That's a, good, that's a good way of thinking about it. So something I ask all my guests, which is a perfect little pivot here, what is a polymath to you? I've never really thought about the term outside of the fact that your podcast is called. I guess to me, a polymath is someone who just like is good at a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. what, what do you guess normally say to that? It's interesting because even the people who have never heard the term before or people who consider themselves to be polymaths, I always get a very interesting answer from anybody. I think for you too, I think you've said it already, where making connections in an interdisciplinary way and pulling things together, making links and connections between them is really what comes up. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Would you consider yourself to be polymathic? I don't like to... It, it... <sighs> Without, why not, without saying polymath, boastful. It would, be, it, would, it would be a bit too braggy, <laughs> I think. I, I think that polymathic and polymath are two different things, really, in a way. Because it's almost like having the multi-potential light, someone with the potential to do many different things. If you're a polymath, you're like Leonardo da Vinci, who's like a master of many different areas. But if you're polymathic, it just means you're more of a generalist who, who likes to be, have a wide berth of knowledge. Oh, okay, yes. I would definitely consider myself polymathic <laughs> rather than a polymath. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I've help, found helpful for this divergent interdisciplinary life is like databases such as Google Sheets, Airtable. We have mentioned Notion earlier too. Where do you see yourself using databases the most in your life? So the, the, the obvious answer is um, our video schedule is all, part, is all like a, a very elaborate database on Notion. Uh, we have a link database with, all us, with our sponsored video schedule and then that links to the videos database and then the videos database links to our ideas database and there's this, all these elaborate connections. But one area that I'm... I'm sort of starting to use databases more as kind of like a, a personal CRM, mm -hmm. um, like kind of keeping track of the people that I meet and kind of friends and how often I actually want to keep in touch with them. And uh, some people would argue that, um, you know, building a personal CRM is a solution looking for a problem uh, in that, you know, Ooh, Notion is cool. Why don't I build a personal CRM in Notion? But I've actually found that it does actually help me to keep in touch with friends because I have like a column for next action. And so the other day it, it, it was like a Thursday evening and I was, I was in a bit of a slump and I was thinking, you know, it would be nice to have dinner with someone. I just looked down my list. I was like, Oh, I've got a note to have dinner with my friend Rohan in August sometime. All right. Why don't I message him? I messaged him. He was, he was down. So we just ended up having dinner. And if I didn't have the database, I wouldn't have had that thought process. And so yeah. I'm very excited about kind of building up this database of like people that I meet and people that I hang out with. And yeah, maybe it'll be useful at some point. You know, what's funny is that I did the exact same thing for the polycast guests. Before I even had the first guest on the show, I made a CRM for it to make sure I could organize everything in there. What about Notion do you really love? What have you done in it that's like really blown your mind? Hmm. I think the thing about it that I really love is just that it's so pretty and nice to use. Mm -hmm. And that makes such a big difference. You know, especially if like, you know, I, I care a lot about form. And so part of the reason I don't really like using Rome is just because it kind of looks a bit ugly. But I love using Notion because it's an absolute pleasure and joy to write on. Uh, the reason I hate Evernote, even though I still use it, is because it's just not, not a pleasure to use. And yeah. the Notion is a pleasure to use. So that's probably the main thing. <laughs> I don't think it does anything particularly novel. It's just a you know, taking app that combines to-do lists and Kanban boards and stuff. But yeah. it just does it in such a beautiful way and therefore makes me more likely to use it. Yeah. I couldn't use Evernote. I can never get into it. I moved everything from Evernote to Notion. 
So moving down just a little bit on the thing, something I struggle with, which I think you might relate to is finding the time to relax. And considering that you're taking this time now off from work and doing your own personal thing, we talked about a little bit earlier too, and let myself be unproductive and perhaps go play a video game like I mentioned earlier. What do you see, where do you see the balance coming into play there? Productivity versus relaxation. Yeah, I don't know. I think I've tried in the past to schedule in relaxation i.e. where I would tell myself I'm not allowed to do any work after 10 p.m. But I feel like that's, for me, that's probably not the right approach because sometimes on some days I'll find that actually at 10 p.m. I, my energy levels are high. I feel super motivated. I just want to bash out another video. And so to have this rule that I'm not allowed to do work after 10 p.m. would just be a bit weird. I think now what I'm, what I'm doing more often is, is I'm just, I'm actually doing what I feel like doing in the moment, <laughs> which is a weird thing because as a productivity guru, um, <laughs> You know, if someone's struggling with motivation, the answer to that equ equation is discipline. Is that you know you act, you don't do what you feel like doing because you're going to feel like watching Netflix, uh, but you should actually do your homework. But I think once you get to a point where you don't actually have to worry about that, you can then start going back the other in the other direction. And now most of what I do is what I feel like doing in a given moment, and I almost never have to force myself to do something that I don't want to do. And so, for example, tomorrow. I vaguely got scheduled that I want to film an online course for Skillshare, but if I don't feel like it, I don't have to do it. I'll just do something else. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I'm kind of basing my, you know, whether I want to relax or whether I want to do work just based on how I feel in a given moment. Um, and so recently, yeah, reading and audio booking have been my relaxation tools of choice. I've also recently started doing yoga. I'm on like day five That's of cool. like a 30 day program just to see if that actually makes a difference in my life. Yeah. It's a flexibility, maybe some meditation in there. That's cool. I love it. Well, what about you? How do you, how do you figure out the, the, re the relaxation thing? I often just let myself play a video game. And the other night I stayed up till 3 a.m., 4 a.m. playing Resident Evil 2, even though I never stay up late like that anymore. <laughs> but I was like, I'm enjoying this. And I'm going to probably feel the repercussions tomorrow a little bit with like a lack of sleep, but I never get to enjoy much anymore. So let's do it. Let's go ahead and play it. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Was it yeah. on PC or PlayStation? Or what? Uh, I have all three, actually, not to sound braggy, but I, I just happen to have them. I played it on PS4 out of... Okay. Stance. Yeah. And, and I guess, I guess you've got a TV then. Yeah. 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 Cause I don't, I don't have a TV and I've been thinking of getting a TV just purely for the, for the PS4. Cause I feel like that it, it would be because, because at the moment, if I want to play horizon, I have to yeah. sit at my computer desk, connect the PS4 to my monitor. I have black bars on either side of the screen cause it's a 49 inch ultra wide that can't handle <gasps> kind of, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then it, 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 it just feels like I'm spending more time on the computer. Whereas I feel like if I had a nice sofa and a TV, I would spend hours and hours and hours just <laughs> with PlayStation. So, you know what's funny? I, I have an ultra wide display right here. It's 29 inch. So it's a lot smaller, obviously. And it's, it's only 21 by nine instead of like what, 32 by nine yeah. that you have there. But I actually found that stretching out the PS4, like 60 by nine screen to fill it at 21 by nine was actually really enjoyable. I actually preferred that stretched out versus like a 4K display, a TV. Oh, but doesn't it, but it stretched out as in you can see more peripherally or actually everything just seems stretched out? It, is you see more periphery. Like if you have if you have a gaming monitor and you have a computer who can handle the extra processing of creating the pixels in that space, you actually yeah. see more in games. Where oh, I, I, that's I pretty think, handy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for example, I play Apex Legends on my PC and I see more horizontally that way. I think I can't remember if the, the shooter games do it, but like I think a lot of other games will give you more horizontal space oh, that's, versus that, on that's console. Very ideal. Yeah. Yeah. Versus on console, it kind of just squishes down and you mm. have to squish stretch it out. But it even stretched, it looked better than if it was like 4K. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I remember when I first got an ultra wide and started to play World of Warcraft, I was just astounded at how much screen real estate I had. I was, oh, this is amazing. I can see it all around me. So, yeah, yeah. excited to try and do like a gaming PC setup or something when for November. I will happily help you out with that if you want to. I love building PCs and I'll give you advice if you want. Oh, amazing. That would be really handy because I know absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> Perfect. And something I actually wanted to ask you about, like number 20, the question here is your experience with super ultra wide monitors. How did it feel for you? Was it worth it? I have three screens here for context, just so you know. So I'm curious. Yeah. Um, the first proper, I think the first proper ultra wide I had was a 34 inch mm -hmm. and it was really nice uh, because you can have two windows side by side. Yeah. And I have a 49 inch, which LG <laughs> have sent me so I don't have to buy it. Uh, so oh. nice. I can now have three windows side by side. So it's a, like I have... I have a normal 27 inch or something display in the middle. And then on either side, I have my own separate kind of windows. And so normally my main window of like Chrome will be in the middle and then I'll have Slack and then email open on the side. Mm -hmm. And it feels like almost a three monitor setup, but without like the bezels. So it, feel, it feels pretty good. 
Well, like for example, even with my 21 by nine here, I have the Zoom meeting open up in like basically a 1080p window here, but on the side I have the notes in a squished little format there. It's really nice, I think, productivity wise. So yeah, I just saw that on your uh, channel. I was like, oh, I want to ask him about that because I love those yeah. screens. <laughs> no, it's quite nice having a 49 inch. If I had to buy it myself, I probably wouldn't. Mm. Uh, but <laughs> you know, when you're a tech YouTuber, <laughs> you get free stuff. Yeah. So you've gotten quite a, uh, quite a lot of people on your podcast, including people I really enjoy and quite admire, Sarah Dietschy, Derek Severs. What did they say when, they, when you asked them to come on and whatnot? Like, what, do you have any advice on getting people like that on? Oh, so both of those I, I, I already kind of knew. Uh, mm -hmm. so Sarah Dietschy, I knew through Twitter. And you know, when you're both YouTubers, you kind of know each other. And Derek Severs, I actually had dinner with in Cambridge when he was visiting for a conference. Cool. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd made a video where I was talking about one of his books, which changed my life. And someone tweeted it to him and tagged both of us in it. And he just replied to the tweet saying, hey, Ali, I'm going to be in Cambridge on this day. Do you want to grab dinner? And I, my mind was blown. I was like, oh my God, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I was meant to be on call that day on surgery. So I, but I begged a friend to take my shift so that I could have dinner, didn't, I could have dinner with Derek Sivers. Yeah. Um, and so when it came to, yeah, we were just kind of emailing back and forth. I was like, hey, by the way, Derek, do you want to be on my YouTube channel as a live stream? And he was like, yeah, sure. And so that, that was just it. That's <laughs> so, crazy. I'm not sure I have any tips because I don't think I've really cold emailed anyone to come on. It's mostly been warm intros from people that I've already known. Yeah, I've either had warm intros or matchmaker, which is kind of cold, but you're in the mindset on that platform of meeting. You are actually one of the few cold people I reached out to. And that's just because I, I wanted to talk with you. But it's like, that's interesting how you just happen to have dinner with him. I have his book on my desktop here, the new one, the, Your Music and People. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes, I've got that on Kindle. I haven't read it yet. Now, one thing I wanted to actually talk to you about is like in August, you essentially said you're taking a break from being a doctor in your day job to focus on content creating. How do you expect things to unfold and what do you want to try? Ooh, uh, the honest answer is I don't really know. Okay. Well, the, the thing I'm worried about is that what if my whole brand is so tied into the fact that I'm a doctor that people will stop caring and I'll just be a generic productivity YouTuber. And like... There's nothing wrong with that, but it seems a bit of a shame to have gone through eight years of medical training <laughs> to not then use that badge as a badge of honor on my, on my personal brand. Mm -hmm. So that's what I worry about. Um, but what I'm hoping for is that, you know, if I have the time to make, kind of make this a full-time gig, I can pour fuel on the fire because it's kind of going really well and the algorithm's being nice to me. And there's still so much low-hanging fruit in, the, you know, in making online courses and like digital downloads and maybe a membership platform. There's all these kind of very logical next steps that working full time and doing on the side probably could have done it, but it would have been a lot more stressful. Where, whereas I kind of like the idea of, hey, you know, I've been working quite hard now. Let me take a little bit of time off, enjoy myself, but also try and grow all of these different channels. So I'm hoping stuff will grow. I'm hoping we'll expand out into interesting content areas, but I'm not really a man with a plan. So we'll just kind of see what happens. Yeah. One of my guests, actually the person I released today, was Santi Younger, he mentioned something to me. I don't remember who he referred to upon it, but it was an interesting concept where every so often this person will take, like every seven years, he would take a year off from everything and just relax. And then every seven months or so, he'll take a month off to relax and same thing oh. every week. And like, yeah, having it basically it's scaled like, like Sean that. West. I think so. I think that's Sean the... McCabe. Yeah, he's, a, he's he's famous for his uh, sabbaticals. He's got yeah. he's writing a book about it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the kind of the concept I was thinking. They're like, this is almost like your sabbatical, but for content creation, basically. And you get a kind of chance to focus on your self development, focus on yourself, see where you want to go next, and take your time because you spent eight years in school. You might as well take it now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I sometimes think of it as a sabbatical, but I feel it's funnier to just call it unemployment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sabbatical sounds legit, whereas unemployment sounds like I'm being, I'm being a lazy slob. Um, <laughs> and I just like the fact that that's the impression that I'm giving. <laughs> so, that's funny. Yeah. Well, and I was actually going to ask you, where do you want to take your personal brand next, whether it's courses or something like that? So there's actually a thing called specialproject.io, where it's just kind of like a Netflix and YouTube hybrid where you can make a subscription model for your content. And you have a big backlog, so you might be able to make some series through that and make your oh. own Netflix in a way and build income through there. Yeah, so we, we kind of have that already. Like my, my agency has a platform called Nebula, which is like mm -hmm. a, a streaming platform. So it's sort of like its own Netflix. And so we all kind of own a bit of a stake in that. And I already make content for that. So I probably wouldn't do another similar one. But I am thinking kind of like a membership site, kind of like Patreon, but kind of probably on my own website um, yeah. where, you know, people who pay $5 a month or something get free access to all my classes and all courses and get monthly 
live AMAs or whatever, you know, just the standard thing that you would do with the membership site. Have you ever thought about like using Patreon for that? I've thought about using Patreon for that. Um, I'm leaning towards more doing it on my own website because uh, I know how to code <laughs> and therefore yeah. I can. And because it's, it means you have a lot more control over what the user experience is. Mm -hmm. the, the vibe of Patreon is very much that support me and support my work. Whereas the vibe I want to give is more like, you know, this is valuable stuff that you're getting. <laughs> Here's a price tag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, out of curiosity, what did you use to build your website? Is I use Ghost. Code? Ghost? Okay. I was thinking like there's a WordPress plugin that helps connect with the stuff like that. But if you're using Ghost, it's different. But Ghost mm. is interesting. I actually haven't got a chance to use it. What is your thoughts on that just real quick? Oh, I love it. I've been using okay. it since like 2015. It's so much yeah. nicer than WordPress. Yeah. I really hate WordPress with a passion because I've been using it for all my like business websites since like mm -hmm. 2010. And it's just such a ball ache to like, you know, make it your own and hack it and figure out how the code's working. And then it ends up really slow. Whereas yeah. Ghost was such a breath of fresh air when I first started using it and I haven't really looked back. Do you, how does that work? Do you have your own hosting and you don't have to pay the monthly fee that they have or do you pay the monthly fee? I, um, I pay the monthly fee. Okay. Um, That's like, yeah. yeah. At one point I was, uh, I've, I've tried at various points to self host it, mm -hmm. but the monthly fee is so reasonable and it's so annoying managing yeah. your own server that I just pay the monthly fee and I forget about it. It's good advice because I thought about using Ghost. I've, I've looked at it for years. I just thought I'd ask. And before I end up wrapping up too, I wanted to ask you because you thought about my internet TV. Are you looking forward to the Horizon Zero Dawn sequel? And like, would you get a PS5 to get it and that kind of thing? Oh, I'm, def I'm definitely going to get a PS5. Um, okay. I haven't finished uh, Horizon Zero Dawn yet. So, but once I do, it's, it's, it's really good so far. So definitely a kind of sequel would be interesting. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, and I'm playing through The Last of Us as well. And so I need to then, then play The Last of Us 2. Yeah. Yeah. I actually haven't got around to playing Last of Us. I, I have it, but never did it. People are going to hate me for it. There's also Marvel's Spider-Man, which is another one you should try. Oh, is that good? Yeah, it's fantastic. It's one of the few games and basically any memory I can think of that I got 100% on. It was that good. And then 100% completion? Or... Yeah. Oh, damn. Okay, you must have played it for a while. Then. <laughs> yeah, I <just> thought, <laughs> thought I mentioned that. But um, you consider yourself quite a, like, a stoic. And where did that philosophy come into your life? I think I've always kind of been leaning towards that attitude. And I never could quite understand why people would be emotionally affected by negativities and stuff. Uh, you know, thankfully, I've had a, held a fairly sheltered upbringing and I haven't had any major negative life events. But then when I first read, uh, I think it was William Irvine's The Guide to the Good Life. I, it really spoke to me and I was like, oh my God, someone's been thinking about this stuff and <laughs> this is exactly what I've been feeling and this makes so much sense. So that, I think I probably first discovered it through Tim Ferriss talking about stoicism on the Tim Ferriss show. And I think I started listening to that in like, I don't know, 2016, 2017. Um, yeah, so that was when I, I kind of first understood stoicism. Right. I'm glad I asked that. So I thought that was really interesting about you. And so kind of wrapping up here, where could people find you online if they want to learn more? Oh yeah. So probably the main source would be my YouTube channel. Just search Ali Abdal. Uh, you can spell that however you like and it'll hopefully autocorrect. Um, <laughs> and then you'll find links to my website, Twitter, Instagram, podcast, all of that stuff through there. Perfect. I'll have your name on the uh, title anyways, and all your links oh, in the description nice. just to make it easier for you. But I thought verbal confirmation in case someone's listening in, that kind of thing. Fantastic. And then obviously besides checking you out and checking out the content, what could be a call to action for our audience to practice today? Hmm. Call to action. Recommend playing World of Warcraft. Try warcraft.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's really I good. Didn't, I didn't see that coming. Okay, but yeah, yeah that's awesome. <laughs> and then once again, this is Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator, and Ali Abdal, future polymath, doctor creator on the Polymath Polycast. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me.